a herzlich willkommen, a very warm welcome to you all. So my name's Kat Hall. I'm associate professor at Swansea University and I work on crime fiction. And I also run the Mrs. Peabody Investigates blog, which is about international crime fiction. And I'm passionate in particular, of course, about German crime. So we're very, very lucky this evening to have four wonderful authors with us. And they're going to help us showcase German crime fiction and British crime fiction with a German twist. Mechtel lives in Bielefeld, but hails from the lower Rhine area of Germany. Following a diverse career in theatre, dance and the restaurant trade, she began writing crime fiction in 2006. And her first three crime novels were police procedurals that were set in Cleaver, which is a small town on the German-Dutch border. Her most recent novels are Der Geiger, The Violinist, that's a historical crime novel focusing on Russian history, and Die andere Hälfte der Hoffnung, The Other Half of Hope, which amongst other things explores the trafficking of Eastern European women. So Mario Giordano, here on my, my right, is based in Cologne and is a very well-known screenwriter and novelist. Since 2000, Mario has also written for a number of iconic German TV crime series, including Tatort, Polizeiruf 110 and Schimanski. And more recently, he's authored a trilogy of Vatican thrillers entitled Apocalypsis 1, 2 and 3. This year, perhaps slightly unexpectedly, he published a comic crime novel set in Sicily. And the latter, entitled Tante Poldi und die Sicilianischen Löwen, Aunt Poldi and the Sicilian Lions, it's the first in a series, and it may single-handedly overturn the stereotype of the humorless German. <laughs> <laughs> Louise Welsh is based in Glasgow, and she gained a degree in history and ran a bookshop for several years before becoming a full-time writer. Louise has written seven novels that draw on a variety of genres, such as the psychological thriller, the gothic tale, and apocalypse crime. Two of her novels, The Bullet Trick and The Girl on the Stairs, depict Scottish protagonists adrift in Berlin. 2014 and 2015 saw the publication of the first two parts of her Plague Times trilogy, A Lovely Way to Burn and Death is a Welcome Guest. Michael Ridpath grew up in Yorkshire and studied history at Oxford University. He left a career in the city to become a full-time writer after the success of his first novel, Free to Trade, in 1995. After publishing eight financial thrillers, Michael changed direction, creating the Icelandic Fire and Ice series in 2010, whose lead investigator is an American Icelandic detective, Magnus Jonsson. Michael has also published two historical crime novels, or spy novels, Traitor's Gate in 2013 and Shadows of War in 2015. Traitor's Gate is about a plot to assassinate Hitler in September 1938, which seemed like a brilliant idea for a spy story to me, except obviously we all know that Hitler wasn't assassinated in 1938. And so I inserted a letter at the beginning of Traitor's Gate, page one, which somehow makes the ending from being a bit dull to um, really quite exciting. It's amazing how easy it was to fix. And what I want to read to you now is that um, first, first page, which is just a letter. Berlin, 20th, 7th of September, 1938. Dearest Father, by the time you receive this letter, he will be dead. The newspapers will say that his assassin was an unknown German officer. It wasn't. It was me. It is quite likely that I will also be dead. So I want to explain to you why I killed him. When I was a boy, you taught me that war is wrong. I listened to you then, but it was only when I had lived through about eight months of hell in Spain that I knew what you meant. War is coming, and we have both seen how horrific modern war can be. Millions will die. This time, it won't be just the young men. It will be the children, the women, the old, the innocent. 
I am an historian trained to analyze economic and social causes for everything. But if ever in history there has lived an individual who through the force of his own will can destroy a continent, it is he. He is evil and he must be stopped. I am fortunate to be able to stop him. And Mechthild is going to read an extract that is set in 1939. The trees and hedgerows display the reds and golds of fall, and the sweet scent of late season apples and pears mingled with the earthy smell of fresh ploughed winter ready fields. Therese was helping her mother with the laundry. She came out of the cellar with a wicker basket full of boiled linens and put it down in the yard. She used a rag to wipe the lines that were stretched out over five poles. She had tied the little bag of wooden clothes pegs like an apron in front of her belly. The cold bit into her wet hands as she hung a wet sheet over the line. At that moment she saw him, standing by the back gate to the yard, and she cried out. He had a gash over his right eyebrow. His left eye was swollen shut, his lips split open. Margaret Paul came running up the cellar steps and stared at her husband. Then she clasped him in her arms, whimpering. It's not true. It can't be true. Over and over again she touched his battered face. Over and over again she repeated the same phrase. It was the kind of day that reminded Jane of her childhood. A bleak November Sunday that huddled people into their coats and set feet walking fast. Beyond the window of the cab, a large man in an ice-blue ski jacket paused while the Yorkshire Terrier, whose leash he was holding, squatted on the grass verge. Jane supposed that somewhere a lady was keeping cosy, waiting for her fat man and her little dog to return. She bet the Terrier would be in his mistress's arms before the man had even extricated himself from his jacket. <laughs> Erzählt, wie und warum die Poldi nach Sizilien kommt und was ihre Schwägerinnen davon halten. Ohne Perücke und Brandyflasche läuft gar nichts. Die Poldi lädt zum Schweinsbraten. Macht ihre I'm able to function without a wig on a bottle of brandy. Poldi invites everyone to a roast pork lunch. Makes her nephew an offer he can't refuse and gets to know her neighbors in the Via Baroness. One of them goes missing and soon after. On her 60th birthday, my aunt Poldy moved to Sicily, intending to drink herself comfortably to death with a sea view. <laughs> that, at least, was what we were all afraid of. But something always intervened. Sicily is complicated. You can't even die there just like that. Something always gets in the way. Then events speeded up, and someone was murdered, and nobody admitted to having seen or known a thing. It goes without saying that my aunt Poldy, being the classic Bavarian she was, had to take matters in her hand, in hand herself and sort them out. And that was when difficulties arose. My aunt Poldy, a glamorous figure, and always ready to make a dramatic entrance. I'd like to start by asking Louise and Michael to talk about their links to Germany and why they chose to set some of their novels there. Probably most British writers um, who are lucky enough to get translated into German, um, we have this lovely experience of going to Germany and being sent on tour. And I think that was the first um, real connection with the country that I had, a very enjoyable connection. I was very, very lucky to then get a, a year-long residency at the Villa Concordia in Bamberg, in Bavaria, which was a hugely, hugely happy time for me. I've lived in Berlin for six months as well, so, so really nice connections and hopefully ongoing connections um, with writers and artists in Germany as well as here. Mm. Uh I have less of a connection to Germany. Though they say write about what you know um, when you start writing, and so I wrote about the city because I used to work in the city. But after doing that for eight books, I wanted to start writing about what I didn't know, but was quite interested in. And like Louise, I've been on a, a few um, little tours of Germany, and I, I was interested in the country and wanted to find out more about it. So the idea of setting a book there seemed 
really intriguing and exciting and extremely scary. Uh, so it was really an interest in the unknown but interesting rather than something which I had a, a strong knowledge of. This all sounds very lovely. You have a lovely relationship with Germany. But your depiction of Berlin, it's a really dangerous place in Traitor's Gate for some obvious reasons. And in The Girl on the Stairs, Berlin is a very unsettling, scary place with dark graveyards and um, back courtyards that are, are full of menace. So has Berlin got the potential to be this threatening space? Could it, could it have been Munich? Could it have been Frankfurt? Or did it have to be Berlin? I thought about this story for about seven years. I, I lived in Berlin. I lived in uh, Mitte. I was lucky enough to rent an artist's flat in the centre of Mitte. So it was a bit, already quite a shishi area at that point. Um, but my apartment looked out onto a back house. And it was a derelict um, back house. And there was a window there that would open with the wind and close <laughs> with the wind. And that, that really was just the beginning of the story, I think, came very much from the place. Um, history is usually a part of my novels too, even when they're based firmly in the, the 21st century. And I guess I'm also interested in uh, the way in which we deal with histories. And I think that's part of the part of the tension and part of the story in this book, the histories that we acknowledge and the histories that we don't acknowledge, the stories that are at the front and the stories that are hidden away and how much... Um, how much of those we can actually really know. The difficulty about writing about Berlin in 1938, possibly Germany in 1939, is this thumping great Second World War that we're looking through from here. But obviously for people at the time in 1938, looking at Berlin's history up to then, that they couldn't accept that Berlin was scary. I mean, they were beginning to, but Berlin was the most modern, high-tech, exciting, cultural, cultured, civilised city in Europe. I mean, it was much cleaner, faster, brighter than London. And although as the 30s got on, people were beginning to realise that, you know, what was happening was more than just the imposition of order. Ich habe mir zunächst gar nicht so, so großartig Gedanken darüber gemacht, wo eine Geschichte spielt. So Mechtild um, didn't initially think so much about setting as about topic, theme. That's what she focuses on when she's writing. Um, she grew up in Kleve, um, so it made sense to her to set her first novels there. Um, uh, she thinks it makes sense to start with what she knows, which is also what, what Michael said, interestingly. Um, and um, she knows the, the kind of people who live there, um, she knows the landscape, and so it was a kind of safety um, consideration to, um, to, to set the initial novels there. Can I ask you about your work for Tat Ort? This is the iconic German TV crime series. Uh, so Tat Ort means crime scene. And it also has a strong regional flavour. Could yeah. you just explain that and, and your involvement in it? You said it before, like it, you know, the concept is uh, more or less like CSI. Yes. So it's a regional concept. It's, um, uh, it's detectives and, and police officers um, in, in various German cities. And um, since we have a federal system of uh, public broadcasting in Germany, uh, every regional broadcaster has its own tatort, its own... Uh, it's, 90 it's a series of 90 minutes feature films, uh, every, almost every Sunday, uh, where all Germany, everybody is gathering around the TV uh, uh, since 40 years now. I, I, I just told Kat that uh, I've been doing some research for another book in, in Jerusalem, met um, uh, Benedict monks in Jerusalem, who on every Sunday after their last service dash off to their TV room to watch in order to watch uh, Tatort. So it's now for us it's Heimat. When 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 you when you ask um, Germans abroad, they would say uh, Tatort is Heimat for us. So um, yeah, I'm just writing screenplays. That's that's all. So if we were to look back at yourselves, or rather, if you were to look back at yourselves working on your very first project. What advice, knowing what you know now, would you give yourself? I would say when you've done the first draft, when you've, when, you've, when you've written it and you're completely happy with it and you think it's perfect, give it to some people who will show you the problems and then spend a long time, as in 
years rather than months trying to sort them out. Because that's how you learn as a writer. It's the rewriting rather than the initial writing. But I work often with young writers who are young in their career and um, the advice that I usually give to them is to be selfish and to, to, to sit down and do it and... Uh, you know, if that means you have to neglect your children or your, your <laughs> friends, all these things. I think actually writers are perhaps not always the people you want to be married to because I think the only way really to, to produce a book sometimes is to be quite selfish. Um, so my advice would be to be selfish, but I didn't need that advice because I was. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I, I think about myself when I wrote my first book and, and, and it seems to me that this former me is giving me an advice. And the advice is, don't be scared, just do it. Because you did it once, you can do it twice. And just do it, just go on and, uh, uh, and write. Muss ich immer das Gefühl haben, ich weiß genau. Mechthild um, returned to this idea of planning carefully and said that's still what she does today and she still finds that important um, because she needs to at least feel that she knows where she's heading while she's writing, even if that um, kind of meanders. We thank you for your questions and for being here this evening. And all that remains is to thank very warmly our authors, Mechthild, Michael, Louise and Mario, and also Charlotte for her wonderful work as a translator. Thank you very much. Thank you.